Chen, thank you so much for being here today. Um, it's a great opportunity, so we're really happy to to present you uh, our, our webinar on scaling. It's an opportunity offered by the CS in line with their uh, 10th anniversary webinar series. Uh, for those less familiar with the CS, it's an organization that works in uh, regional development through knowledge transfer, mainly in the field of uh, social economy. And um, their team has been working on the topic of scaling in the social economy since 2015. So I don't know if you're familiar with the tools that were produced by the TS over the years, uh, but um, scaling has been really one, one field of expertise as it is quite a complex uh, topic that requires specific expertise and, and dedicated resources. So we're happy to have uh, some um, experts with us to to explain a little bit more about this concept this this phase in the life of a, of a social economy enterprise and as i mentioned so the ts has produced over the years uh, numerous tools to to help social economy enterprise increase their impact and i'm happy to um, present you uh, today those tools that were translated recently into english uh, so that you'll be able to use within your networks as well uh, I'll share my screen. Well, I'll just uh, introduce, uh, present our, our panelists today, and then I'll share uh, my screen to our presentation. So my name is Martin Boyette. I work for the Regional Council of the Environment for the region of the capital, the national capital. Um, and I previously worked at the TS, where I was uh, the project manager for uh, on the topic of scaling. And for our presentation today, we have, uh, we'll start with Hoffman Wolf. Um, who will first introduce his organization. So most of you may be uh, familiar with uh, Hoffman, but uh, um, his organization, and he will help us understand a little bit more the resources available to support social economy enterprises, entrepreneurs, as you may need some of these services if you plan to continue the, the thinking process uh, and the development of your organization or to accompany organizations on the topic of scaling. So following our presentation, you'll know uh, which services are available for you. And then we'll go into details into exploring, exploring the concept of scaling uh, by digging in the tools made available by the TS. And then following our more theoretical presentation, Viviana and Jason will both uh, present us examples of organizations that they have accompanied that have been uh, through scaling strategies. And as I said, we'll take some time at the end for your questions uh, so that you can exchange with our experts, share your thoughts with us directly at the end. So um, without further wait, uh, Hoffman, uh, if you want, I'll, I'll share my screen uh, and you can start presenting your organization with the services available uh, to our English speaking uh, communities. Well, thank you, Martin. CNET is a provincial initiative to better integrate uh, English speaking Quebecers into the social economy. Um, so it's done under the uh, umbrella of the Regional Development Network, and I'll explain a little bit more what that is. Um, and it's funded uh, by the Secretariat for Relations with English-speaking Quebecers. Uh, yeah, we were launched actually December 2021 um, with the goal of, like I said, increasing the participation of English-speaking Quebecers um, in the social, in social economy enterprises. Um, so we provide support for social entrepreneurs, for social economy startups in English, um, and also for some of our regional organizations who are looking to get more involved in it. Um, so providing access to knowledge, expertise to move their projects forward. Uh, next slide. So a little bit more into uh, what we do. Um, it's supporting the ecosystem with um, service and materials in English. There's a lot of organizations. There's a lot of documentation out there. Um, a lot of it is not available in English. The terminology, like we were just saying, is not always well developed in English. Um, so our role is to better, uh, better connect English speakers with materials in their language. Um, a lot of times the different organizations who work uh, with, in, work with, social entrepreneurs in Quebec, they might be, they have, they can't provide the same quality of service in English as they can in French. So our role is to bridge that gap a little bit, um, like with uh, what we're doing today with the, uh, with the scaling guide. Um, we also uh, support our regional organizations, CNET and RDN were made up of um, 18, 17 members throughout the province representing English speaking communities. 
Um, so supporting them with education about the social economy, how do they get, uh, how do they get better connected within their regions? How do they identify the needs that a social enterprise, social economy enterprise might be able to fill? Um, and then we also partner with other provincial English language organizations, whether it's Y for Y, whether it's um, Yes Montreal, whether it's even uh, or local organizations like that. So sort of our goal is to build these partnerships um, with different organizations looking to get into the social economy. Next slide. Thank you. Um, there's also an education component to what we do. Um, the, like I said, the level of involvement in the social economy by English speaking Quebecers is lower. Also the level of knowledge and understanding of what the social economy is tends to be lower. So we do a variety of things to help build this level of knowledge, build this um, uh, sort of database that uh, people can access, people understand. Um, so we have events uh, throughout the year. A lot of them are during Social Economy Month in the province, which is, uh, which is in November. Um, so we have them in, in all regions of the province. This year we were in Gaspé, we were in uh, Montrégie, uh, we were in Bécamo, we were in Quebec City. So depending on what the needs of the local community is, we can create events that speak to their um, that speak to their communities. Um, tool creation and translation, sort of like what we're doing now, um, adapting these adapting different documents into English. Uh, research partnerships to dive deeper into the social economy um, and what uh, oh go back one thanks um, to figure out uh, what sort of. You know, what is the level of knowledge, just different aspects of the social economy as it relates to English speaking Quebec. Mm -hmm. And we do offer webinars, some are scheduled, but we can also do uh, customized to different organizations um, if there's a need there. So, next slide. So to go a little bit more in depth uh, with support for social entrepreneurs, we do this in partnership with the CDRQ. Um, often we'll do it in partnership with local polls with the Chantier, but it can be, it's sort of an A to Z. If somebody simply has identified a need in their community, um, help to, you know, what sort of social economy product, what sort of service would, uh, might, might fit this well. Um, obey and L, is it a cooperative? What sort of model should it be? Um, sort of like what you do for really any kind of business, assessing the industry, looking what kind of funding is out there. Uh, preparing a business plan, all of these things um, in, in collaboration with the CDRQ, uh, we offer that. And yes, next slide. Keep going. Um, so RDN, um, like I mentioned, we're a provincial network of 18 organizations in Quebec's English speaking communities in uh, 13 different regions. Um, principally you're all off the islands of Montreal and Laval. That's our mandate for where our regional organizations are. However, CNET um, does work on the islands. Um, so we're to, uh, we're a province-wide organization. Next. As you can see there, the, there's the map, the red dots are where the headquarters of our different locations are, uh, our different members are, the black dots are where their satellite offices are located. Next. Um, so like I said, about RDN, uh, mission is to enhance and maintain vitality of regional English-speaking communities, uh, which are a vital part of the fabric of Quebec's regions. Um, so collaboration, shared identity, sustainability, equity. Um, so really, uh, CNET's goal is, along with all these things, just to better connect into the social economy ecosystem of the province. As you guys know, there's a lot of different organizations, from the DS, CDRQ, CQCM, Chantier, so it's to better um, to make to help these organizations connect and get better integrated. Just connect with the English speaking populations that are located throughout the province. Um, so our goal is not to be an English speaking clone of these organizations, but to provide support where uh, support in English is lacking. Um, so that's really sort of where uh, CNET fits in and where RDN fits into all these things. I think that's the last slide. Martine, is there anything? After this, okay, um, no. So that's um, that's kind of who we are with CNET. But uh, if you have uh, if you have any questions, if you have a project idea that needs support, if your organization is um, 
looking to better connect into the English speaking community, you can connect, you can contact me, member of our team, and we, we'd love to um, figure out uh, where we can, where we can work together and how we can partner. Thank you, Hoffman. Uh, so that's a really good start to, to set the table to better understand the ecosystem in which we're navigating. And the TS was happy to collaborate with uh, with you, Hoffman, with CNET and the Regional uh, Development Network in order to, to um, promote, finally, the tools that we have and that are now translated in English. So we're really happy that can be useful to some of the uh, of the organizations that are uh, members of your network. Uh, so we can now dig more into the topic of scaling. Uh, and basically we've made a, a sort of, we'll start with a general presentation of the concept. It's not a term that necessarily everyone is familiar with. Uh, so I've the, the outline of my presentation is really to address the question of what is scaling? Why should we consider scaling? Uh, why is it relevant for our organizations as well? And how do we go about planning a scaling strategy? And the how, I'll really start, I think, the, uh, as an introduction. And Viviana and Jason can really show you uh, how it's done uh, with, with more examples. So it will be more easy to understand. So first, we'll go into what do we mean uh, by scaling? Um, scaling refers first to a, a growth with a purpose, a growth that makes sense. So the primary objective of scaling is to increase the social impact of your mission. Um, it's about deploying new strategies to achieve the goal of increasing or sustaining your positive impact for your members or society at large. Um, scaling does not automatically means growth or does not necessarily translate into growth. Uh, it can be the case if an organization decides to diversify its activities, uh, sets up new lines of businesses, for, for instance, uh, but the organization could increase its impact simply by cooperating with, an order, with another organization, which doesn't necessarily change the size of the organization. So usually uh, social purpose organizations will turn to a scaling strategy when they first wish to increase their positive impact for instance, to reach uh, new audiences, to answer to new and unanswered needs, uh, to reach more people in other communities. But they could also consider scaling in order to ensure their economic survival, in order to be more efficient or to perpetuate with their uh, model. So in some cases, and we'll go more into looking at the different strategies uh, for scaling, but in some cases, scaling can involve joining forces uh, with similar or complementary organizations to multiply their potential for action. Uh, and in other cases, it could mean exporting uh, a tested uh, model or a recognized know-how, which saves communities, other communities to have to reinvent the wheel. Um, scaling can also means taking action at a more institutional or political level to bring about more widespread change uh, and to act in a view of social transformation. So in that sense, we really see uh, the this distinction between scaling as an evolution of the organization's business model, of its ways of doing things to generate more impact for its members, whether uh, growth and business development uh, has a, a completely different understanding where uh, scaling is directly linked to the notion of social impact as growth and business development usually refer to the means used by a company, by a business to generate more profitability, more sales, more revenues. So why should we scale? Uh, we see that scaling is an evolution of the organization's business model and it can come when an opportunity is presented to the uh, organization, uh, suddenly offering new opportunities. So we can think, for example, as a new funding program that could bring an opportunity to scale for the organization to develop new services and so on. Um, in other cases, the organization might experience a situation that requires it to thoroughly review its, uh, its model, its way of doing things. If the environment, uh, for instance, has changed, or if the needs or preferences of the, the people deserve, uh, served are no longer the same, um, if the financial sustainability of the organization is threatened, uh, then we might be looking at uh, a scaling strategy. And for others, what we see more often 
is uh, strategic thinking can open the door to uh, scaling. So the organization is, org is conducting, for instance, a strategic planning process that leads it to set new ambitions uh, to project itself onto in the future based on the impact it wishes to have. So that's usually a, a proper time to start thinking about uh, scaling. There are organizations, and maybe Jason and Viviana will, will be able to, uh, to talk a little bit more into details uh, into that, but uh, there are organizations uh, that are, from the moment that they launch their business model, that they start their activities, scaling is already in their mind, that we see that we have something that could be replicated elsewhere that answers to needs that we see in different communities. So there are ways to plan your scaling strategy, but it could be something that is in your mind from the beginning of your organization. Um, and I think it's fair to, to mention here that scaling is not a must. Uh, it's not relevant for all organizations in all situations. It can be a good idea as long as we as long as it remains consistent with the mission, that's something that we really emphasize all the times. Um, and as long as the organization has the capacity to scale, that it doesn't stretch out too much the capacity of the organization. Um, although, as I said before, scaling can sometimes contribute to an organization's financial sustainability. In many cases, it requires significant investment. Uh, to implement. So it might not be the right solution to getting out of a difficult financial situation. Um, and I, I think it's fair to say also that scaling requires, sometimes it's a, it's a really pivotal time in the evolution of an organization, and it requires almost as much rigorous planning as the launch process, because it involves as many risks uh, when we go into such developments. So how to plan your scaling strategy? How do we increase our social impact? We often tend, and we've worked with uh, Jason and other uh, partners to, to determine how do we go about uh, planning our scaling strategy, but how do we go about increasing our social impact? We often see organizations that take as a starting point of their reflection, their current program or their business model. Uh, whereas we feel that it's usually better to uh, take our mission as the starting point in our reflection. What can we do to have a greater impact on a social or environmental issue? This means that sometimes to increase our impact, it's only a part of our current model that needs to be scaled up. For example, uh, an organization might wish to introduce its innovation to new communities presenting similar problems, and it is possible that the best formula to generate the greatest impact will simply be the offering of consulting services or training activities, for instance, and not the exact replication of its current model into other communities. Um, so by taking impact generation and not our program as the starting point of our reflection, we usually open ourselves up to new um, possibilities, to new opportunities. And so before even thinking about what strategies should we adopt to scale, we can, for example, do um, or redo a social transformation diagram exercise, a theory of change, for instance, to define with greater clarity a collective vision of where we want to go, of what's our main goal in the medium or long, long term, and by what means we aspire to get there. This way of doing things usually aligns the team with uh, a shared vision, and it can help us um, avoid falling in the trap of seizing every opportunity that we see that is passing by, such as funding, which push us to develop always new services, new activities, which can end up really stretching our capacities, as I mentioned before. And we realize in the end that these services don't really correspond to the objectives that we have in terms of impact. Uh, so this is why it's usually important to set time and resources aside to evaluate our activities of our current model, to measure the social impact of our actions, before expanding the scope through the implementation of a scaling strategy and thus defining our project even more clearly. And because this is kind of theoretical, it can, it can be a little bit complex. I wanted to give you the example of an organization that presented their strategic uh, clarity exercise that they have called 
uh, within their team to plan their scaling strategy. So the general uh, the general director of a social economy enterprise presented the interesting approach that they have taken collectively to open the reflection on scaling. And they have taken various actions to engage their team and the governance bodies with the aim of increasing the organization's social impact. So from the very beginning of the process, they wanted to make sure that the development of the organization remained a collective project, a collective effort, so that the scaling strategy would not be pushed down from uh, top down, from management to the team. And so their main objective was to drive the ambition to increase our impact within our team. Uh, also, a, a point that is interesting and I find is that this particular organization, they've been in, in ongoing, they've been in business for about 20 years now, and they felt that scaling was a responsibility aligned with their mission. What can we do to do more uh, to achieve our mission now that we're comfortable, now that our business model is, is running and that we're, we're, we're doing fine? Do we want to be more involved to do more in line with our mission? And so their first uh, exercise was to do a social transformation diagram with their team. So they reflected what is our goal in the medium and long term uh, in five years, thanks to us, where will we be, what we will do. And just to give you a, an idea, this particular organization currently has two uh, objectives, two mandates in their mission. First, they do socio-professional reintegration of individuals into the labor market. And their second mandate is to do the reuse of IT equipment. Um, in defining their future with more clarity, they had to agree on a renewed mission statement. Where do we want to concentrate our efforts? And so we understand that how we plan this will have impact on what strategy we'll put in place to achieve that goal. Do we want to focus in the next five years in the medium and long term? Do we want to mainly focus on the socio-professional reintegration of individuals? Or do we want to focus on the reuse of IT equipment? Um, and more broadly, they had the idea, we, do we want to really engage in more largely in the socio-ecological transition uh, going on? So identifying the main goal will determine the strategies to put in place to achieve it. So for instance, in this case, if we want to take action on the socio-professional reintegration of individuals, one of the strategies to achieve that goal would be to diversify their activities so that they can provide more employment to people um, with social professional reintegration uh, needs. If their main objective is to work on the reuse of IT equipment, then in that case, the strategy that they will put in place could involve opening new antennas of their business model, of their organization in different regions of Quebec. And then if they want, if they all agree that their main goal is to act on um, the socio-ecological transition in order to change public policies or, or so on, then in that case, the, the possible strategies will be to create alliances, to cooperate with other organization in order to have more influence uh, to change public policies. So as you can see that in the case given as an example, it's the teamwork that led to the identification of the objectives and then of the, the scenarios that are under consideration. So to achieve that, they formed a, a committee to explore specific uh, proposals. They distributed a survey uh, through the entire team and through their governance bodies as well. And then they led uh, consultations in light of the survey results. Um, so as you can see, there is not a, a single recipe that can be replicated uh, with means and actions that are indicated. The team is still working on fine tuning uh, its scaling strategy and has identified the next steps uh, to move forward in their strategic thinking. So in that case, they'll be documenting their process, researching funding uh, opportunities that are available and carrying out a risk analysis um, to go on. So that was just a, 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 a quick example, but really of the thought process that goes behind uh, all the, the organization's direction into uh, choosing the proper scaling strategy according to the goal that they want to set. We've sort of uh, talked a little bit briefly about the different strategies that are possible to envision when you plan uh, a scaling project, but we've identified 
three main objectives that will justify scaling. And each of these objectives will lead to different strategies being selected. So in the first sort of family of objective, we see uh, strategies to enhance or consolidate your offer. If we aspire, as I said before, to increase your capacity for production or action, maybe because you want to reach out new audiences, uh, meet new types of needs, or even ensure the organization's sustainability. Um, in that case, strategies such, such as cooperation with uh, other organizations can be interesting. Diversification of your products or services. Um, merger with an existing uh, social purpose organization. Uh, that will be one of the examples that will be presented today. Or we can even en envision uh, a look at acquisition or takeover strategies. Um, I just wanted to give you one example uh, of each family of strategies so that you can uh, uh, really understand right away uh, what we're talking about. But I was thinking of the group tech. I know that Jason, you have met them in the past, but group tech is a is a socio, uh, social economy enterprise uh, that um, is a not-for-profit organization that promotes the socio-professional integration of people living with disabilities. And over the years, they have aspired to do more uh, with their mission to provide disemployment uh, to people living with disabilities. And so over the years, they have diversified their services through the acquisition of private companies, through a merger with an organization that shared a similar mission, but that was going through financial difficulties. So it was a good opportunity for them uh, in line with their mission. They wanted to keep people employed. They wanted to employ more people. So in that sense, it made sense to enhance their offer in order to achieve their, their goal. Um, in other cases, organizations will see the relevance of their model for new environments, and they may wish to replicate their model so in that case, we'll be looking at strategies, at dissemination and replication, uh, replication strategies to scale. Um, a good example of that that uh, most people in Montreal mainly are, are familiar with would be Renaissance. So once again, a not-for-profit organization that promotes the socio-professional integration of individuals with difficulties integrating the job uh, market through a network of thrift shop. Uh, they started as one store in 1994, I see, and now they have over 70 stores in Montreal, one coming in Quebec uh, City very soon, apparently, and over uh, a thousand employees. So that's a good example of a replication strategy uh, with um, a head office with different antennas uh, in the, the various neighborhoods of Montreal. And then other types of strategies may also be mobilized when we wish to act on more structural causes of certain realities to bring about uh, more uh, um, change on a larger scale, systemic change, we would call. And we can think about creating alliances uh, to enhance or influence, mainly on a specific sector, or to join forces with others to advocate for change in public, in public policies, for instance. So in Quebec, a good example that we have of scaling with the intention of positively transform the system is the establishment of the, the CPE, the Subsidized Network of Early Childhood Centers, that completely transform the family dynamic uh, by providing an educational program for children who attend them and facilitating uh, work-family balance. So it was a whole process of, of organization, not for profit organization, getting together, forming a network, and then completely transforming the way that we see childcare uh, today. So throughout the work uh, of the TS, we've identified facilitating conditions. Uh, we cannot say that they are recipes for success. It would be a little bit pretentious. We see that there are difficulties along the way, as, as I mentioned before, but we were able to identify through our work specific conditions that if they are aligned, usually mean that there are more chances uh, for success. Uh, and we, we see first, it, it, it's usually uh, rigorous planning, as I've mentioned before, uh, but the commitment of all stakeholders is usually key uh, for a successful scaling strategy. Uh, a strong governance that is backing the scaling strategy as well, that maybe has the competences also to support the scaling uh, process. A favorable and stable economic situation, so we have to make sure that we have the the, the, that we are solid uh, enough to sustain, to support the scaling strategy, and that our sector also is, is favorable to, uh, so if we are in a, in a bad uh, uh, conjuncture, it might be more difficult to envision uh, uh, going through a scaling uh, phase. 
a solid network of partners. And that includes, we feel that that includes partners from the ecosystem. So it's important to be surrounded by uh, experts in different fields, whether it is at looking at your, uh, reviewing your business model, looking at sometimes legal aspects, technical aspects that might be taken into consideration. So um, you have the partners of your organization, but also finding the right partners to uh, move on with your strategy within the ecosystem of, uh, of support. And then the capacity to mobilize human and uh, financial resources uh, within your organization as well. So we have to, as I mentioned before, planning the, the scaling strategy will take time, will take competences, uh, will take financial resources as well. Uh, so it's uh, it, the, there is to be a need to, to be able to mobilize all those resources before going ahead. Um, so my presentation was based on the tools uh, produced by the TS, as I mentioned before. So if you are looking at exploring this topic a little bit more, just know that you have on the TS website access to really a lot of different material. We have the on the left, you'll see the guide uh, scaling the social economy. It's a complete guide that presents you the concept, what it means, all the different strategies with a lot more details than what I was able to give you today. Uh, but uh, you'll, you'll have a really detailed explanation with examples for each strategy that can be considered in your scaling process. And then on the right, we have uh, created a support kit. So as you see, each um, section has different one side, uh, one side, double sided documents for, for example, to uh, to pass along to your board of directors, maybe, or if you want to have this teamwork uh, reflection on on scaling, you have access to all these resources. The first one is really all resources to inform to to find out more information about scaling. Again, some short summaries of what we find in the guide. Then we have access to presentation material and even a support pathway to better understand your role, what, what kind of questions will come up along your pathways to, to scale, to put in place your uh, scaling strategy. So thank you very much. I hope uh, now we're able to uh, go more into details, unless you have some quick questions right now, but I think it's fair to pass along right away the, the, the floor to Viviana. We can explore uh, some examples of scaling strategies that she has met in her practice that can really help us understand a little bit more what we mean and what kind of planning goes behind that and the, the different conditions that will help us succeed our scaling strategy. So Viviane, if you want to uh, go ahead, uh, let me know if you need me to uh, switch the slides for you. Thank you. Thank you, Maxine. And uh, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for having me here. So first, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the CDRQ. The CDRQ is a family of experts in the areas of um, digital transformation, management, governance, um, finance, of course, and we help entrepreneurs within the social economy to um, to achieve their projects, um, uh, either uh, startups, uh, growing businesses, or uh, even um, restructuring businesses, um, we, we can help them with uh, our different uh, experts. So um, I'm here today to tell you about the concrete cases where uh, scaling was uh, used or was a tool that was uh, presented to entrepreneurs by our organization. And um, uh, I'll focus a little bit less on the um, generic information, which is the concepts that Martin uh, very well presented to us. And I'll focus a little bit more on the process. What what shape does it take? How do we uh, bring the tool to the table? How uh, how is it uh, uh, presented like a solution to uh, problems of uh, an organization, etc.? How 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 business uh, how the, the this tool is used in the in the course of a mandate so uh first i'm going to present to you um two projects that did not succeed and then i'm going to tell you about the success success story so we're going to talk about three business cases and uh for the two first i thought that you know, sometimes when we do something well, we don't ask ourselves why did it 
uh, worked. And that's very valuable information to know what uh, we have to, uh, you know, increase or uh, apply even more and, and, and repeat. And when things doesn't go the way we expect it to, uh, we ask a lot of questions to ourselves. And there is where I believe if we can learn from uh, our own mistakes, it's very smart. But if we can, we can learn from mistakes, uh, of order is even smarter. So um, if you go to the next slide, I'm gonna start with the two cases. So uh, first, uh, why haven't the following business cases uh, didn't work out yet? So the first was in the business to business uh, services. Uh, it's important to tell a little bit of the um, background. And the second case was in the agri-food. Uh, uh, what uh, what uh, what was that thing that uh, didn't allow the, the project to succeed yet is the the fact that um, the scaling uh, tool wasn't uh, the result of a strategic planning or an uh, identify clearly a challenge that the company was facing or um, align with the mission it was a pre it wasn't a previous uh previous uh, problem identified for what the scaling was the solution so that that was a bad uh starting it was like a very attractive tool with very uh, hand, uh you know um you know, it's with the business words and we, we, you know, we, the entrepreneurs like got attracted to that, but wasn't the right uh, um, environment for, 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 for to put in practice the, um, the, the tool. So first of all, management and the board of directors uh, lack interest and capacity to allocate the time. So when we are in a startup or where, when the company is still uh, trying to reach the, um, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, break even point. Uh, so maybe it's not really a right time to, uh, to start thinking on scaling. Um, since, uh, you know, you're going to need uh, finance uh, resources, human resources, and, you know, also the uh, capacities of, of management and board of directors, we have to know uh, what the capacities and the, uh, you know, the, the, the knowledge of uh, each position and uh, the role occupying it, it's, it, it, you know, governance is a very important tool to, it has to, the, uh, the company has to have a strong governance in order to apply a tool like a scale. So the other thing is uh, not enough resources, like not enough employees to take on a committee and to make advance the project. Um, insufficient uh, resources like finance and technologies and unable to know what we don't know. That's a very important thing because uh, those kind of uh, blind spots uh, uh, are very important to um, to identify. Uh, knowing what we don't know is something very, it's a, it's, it's a very valuable information. And when, when we are ready to apply scaling, we have to, to be able to, to have that assessment. So if we go to the next slide, we're gonna see um, uh, what the successful example of scaling can, can, can be. And uh, before uh, talking about this uh, case, I would like to, I know that Martin and Camille are on the, in the room. So I'll ask you guys to put the camera on because uh, uh, Camille and uh, Martin are the uh, responsible for this success. And um, so Camille, Martin, if you want to say just hello. Hello. I want to say <laughs> you're responsible for the success, though, that the client is. <laughs> <laughs> well, but uh, it was with uh, our consulting services. So thank you very much. Uh, to both of you for sharing this case. So how uh, it all started, the social enterprise work uh, on a strategic planning uh, with the CDRQ. So the strategic planning is kind of doing an assessment where the company is right now, what the challenges are either internally or externally and what the solutions could be. So uh, through the process, uh, the identified witness uh, was the obsolete technologies and the incapacity to keep uh, up to date with technologies. So what does it mean is like they didn't have uh, the, the adequate software to 
to provide the services that were the, 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 they give themselves the mission to do so. And they didn't have the expertise in house. Uh, in order to keep up to with that kind of technology, uh, you need to have like uh, manpower and uh, qualified man manpower in house. So uh, the portfolio of the organization, just to uh, give you a, a context, is uh, technologies and acknowledge in technologies were a key uh, co uh, to, to continue offering the high standard service quality. Uh, the mission is to promote and sell electronic books and paper books uh, through its website platform. So here we have very important, very, very important information. First, the website wasn't a promotional website only. It was on top of being promotional, it was a transactional website. And we probably all of us know what the risks are related to that. So that there are uh, IT security, uh, non-refutable transactions, et cetera, so are, are very high risk. And the uh, up-to-date up um, software and services is, is very important. So IT was a huge part of the services that we're offering. And uh, in the strategic planning, they realized they didn't have uh, the uh, resources in order to ensure that uh, uh, keep up to date. So uh, it is also an association for the promotion of independent workshops. Um, the, uh, the client uh, uh, allow us to provide you with the name. It's a very nice uh, company. Uh, it's a very, very nice uh, enterprise, sorry. In Quebec, it is called the Libraire. And... Um, We'll, uh, sorry, Martin, I was trying to advance the, <laughs> I forgot. If we go to the next slide. So uh, how did it work? And as Martin uh, presented to us very well, uh, there are facilitating conditions or uh, uh, success uh, key uh, factors. And very, very important. If you don't know where you're going, you might not get there. So we identified the risk. And then we decide what is the uh, answer to the risk. Are we going to transfer the risk? Are we going to take it as it is? We're going to buy to it or we're going to share it? What, what are the mitigants we're going to uh, adopt? That's a very important step. That's the first step. And Martin uh, described it very well. Here you have a very concrete example. Then we match the scaling strategy to the uh, decision of the enterprise and of the social entrepreneurs to uh, the risk identified. So the weakness on the IT, either the, uh, the, the, the tools and the know-how uh, in-house. So uh, the, uh, the strategy was to enhance or consolidate the offer with, uh, by, provide, what, by uh, adopting a website, a transactional website that is up to date with all the security and all the uh, financial uh, related risk uh, to the uh, online transactions. So uh, the entrepreneurs decided to go for cooperation and acquisition of a co-enterprise. What does it mean is a partnership between the social enterprise and the private enterprise who provided the expertise uh, in IT and keeping the platform up to date. So if we go to the next line, uh, we're gonna we're gonna see what the outputs were. So uh, following the strategy that was uh, put in place uh, by my colleagues Camille and Martin uh, together with the entrepreneurs, uh, there was a, an increase in the number of and quality of financial and business partnerships. So we uh, there was an exchange of uh, shares. Uh, uh, so we'll, we'll I'll continue and then I explain every one of them. Uh, there was an increase in, in the quality of the risk management. We took the risk, we decided the answer uh, to the risk and we put it in, into practice. And then there was a, a, a core expertise uh, that was ensured in a market with a shortage of qualified labor. In, this is uh, it, it, it's double way, right? Because we took the IT expertise that was core for the business and we 
make sure that the right people was occupying the right role and the, the, uh, the, the with uh, with uh, key, uh, key performance indicators, but also uh, the uh, uh, social enterprise could uh, focus on the, their core of expertise, which is the promotions uh, promotions of um, uh, uh, paper books and electronic books and uh, and, and, and the, the market in Quebec, etc. So uh, that increases a lot governance because you have the right person, the right uh, um, enterprise taking care of the right uh, economic activity. Then. Um, Fundraising, of course, capitalization, exchange of shares, so equity increase in both cases, and improve of the quality of democratic governance since all the uh, the uh, members were uh, um, committed uh, to a committee on the um, deployment of the scale tool, and there was also a comp uh, competency of inventory. It's like knowing what we don't know in order to go and get it if we need it. So if we go to the next line. So uh, the, su the success factors were like the commit commitment of all stakeholders, uh, all the employees and external st stakeholders made, made time to do the job, to to put in practice the uh, uh, scaling uh, a strategy as a result of uh, strategic planning so aligned with a mission that's very important you're not going to apply a tool that keeps you away from your mission objective and vision of the uh, of of the um, stakeholders and uh, management a strong governance uh, so uh, inventory of competences versus roles and responsibility for each uh, individual in, within the organization and outside the, of the organization. Identifying what we don't know, so we know, we don't uh, so we identify kind of the blind spots. Uh, a favorable and sustainable economic situation. So the social enterprise uh, was far beyond beyond the startup phase and had the accumulate uh, had uh, uh, accumulated enough non distributed surpluses to be able to uh, defasan autonomous or organically finance the uh, deployment of the scaling. So they had the financial res resources to 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 uh, deploy the uh, the uh, scaling a solid network of partners this is the most important i think is they were so strong in this uh, in this item because they they have a government social networking in industry related partners that helped to deploy this strategy and a capacity to mobilize human and financial resources of course is related to the prior one uh, financial success uh, to engage uh, you know, the, the, the company had already the financial success. The, the problem was they were having more demand that they could supply. And and so they had the, the, the money in order to finance the, um, the scaling strategy. And the partnership provided uh, additional capital as well. So if we go to the next slide. Uh, in this case, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll invite, uh, give the mic to Camille and uh, Martin um to see if there is anything uh they they would like to add otherwise uh i'll give back the mic to um jason perhaps uh, just a few words uh, you synthesizes the the situation very well i would just like to stress how at the time uh, what happened to the libraire was a challenge that they decided to uh, change into an, an opportunity and there it's really a strong governance that uh, succeeded in doing that. I remember vividly during the pandemic, uh, their uh, uh, their server w had to support, I think, fifteen hundred percent more traffic than they had usually because people were co confined at home and they wanted to buy books. Every businesses were uh, were closed, so they they bought online and they bought a lot. And I I, uh, I went uh, with their IT guys in their server room, and it was literally praying in front in front of the server. Please hold, please hold. And 
And then I ask him, do you want to sacrifice a chicken or something? And <laughs> you have to do something, man. And uh, that's when they decided, that, okay, uh, the situation now can is not sustainable. And really the change is qualitative, not quantitative. It's not the, that they decided to grow. The growth appeared and then they had to do something. And that's what Viviana just described. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Martin. The mic is yours. Thank you, Viviana. So those are really interesting examples. And I really like, you're absolutely right that sometimes we have to learn from those who are not successful in implementing their scaling strategies. And that's something that we also uh, look into because we follow through the years, a lot of organizations, some of them have scaled without knowing that they had scaled already. Uh, so just looking more into the process and learning from our mistakes or, or learning from uh, others' uh, pathways so that we can avoid making the same mistakes or we can plan a little bit more strategically to ensure the sustainability, the survival of our organization. Because sometimes we see that when we fail at scaling and the resources are too stretched out, it can mean the 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 end of an organization. So we have to be really careful about that. But uh, I'll let uh, Jason now present uh, a, a more positive example. <laughs> now we'll move into more uh, positive, yes, example of, of scaling strategies that were put in place. In the case of Jason, I think it's through a merger. So Jason, if you want to, uh, uh, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Martin. Um, so how much time have we got left? <clears throat> Are we okay for time? We are okay for time. We'll have about 15. So if you want to, to take about 15, 20 minutes, we're uh, until noon. So we'll have some time for questions at the end. Just checking because I, I can scale. <laughs> uh, so uh, let me tell you three. I'm going to tell you three stories as well. Uh, they're all success stories. And then uh, we're going to transition to some lessons learned. And I think you're going to already start to see the lessons. But we're going to we'll, we'll hammer away at the two key important things. Uh, you know, that the team has to be in, involved. Um, you can't push it down from the top. You really have to do it gently. You have to be, use your diplomacy uh, when you're doing this kind of um, scaling. And uh, the governance. And I'm going to, so I'm gonna, those are the two high level uh, lessons uh, that we're going to, that we're going to hammer down uh, at the end. So, um, let me tell you the context. So I've been working with TS actually for some years now. I worked um, on this uh, scaling uh, research action uh, from about the beginning. Um, and we looked at all kinds. Um, I, Martin, you did an excellent job presenting uh, synthetically uh, those 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 years of work. And, and the reports are very, very good. Really super important to look at them before you uh, before you go too much farther along the road. Um, don't only look at those. If you want to find some excellent work, uh, look at all the stuff that TS has, man has made. It's 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 been an exceptional ten years. Um, I've I've participated in other things with TS. I love you. I love you, TS. <laughs> um, ten more years, I hope. Um, let me tell you three stories. So the context is that. Um, at the beginning of 2023, I'm working again with TS on a in a working group. There, there are some groups that want to try and scale, uh, and they're going to try and figure their way along that path. Uh, it seems to me uh, at the time that the best way to uh, help uh, the group that I was working with was to talk with a couple of groups that had successfully been on that pathway recently. Two of those groups I had actually worked with. And one we found through TS, uh, um, through the network. Uh, so what we did was, um, well, we interviewed the, the, the key people, the key person in those three exercises. And we extracted from them in the course of about a half an hour, 45 minutes, some of the high level lessons learned. So I'm going to try and tell these stories in a way that doesn't uh, betray who they are. But I'm sure if you're smart and you look around, you'll probably figure out. You'll probably figure it out. Um, the first example is two groups in culture. This is inner city Montreal. Uh, much of the social economy in the downtown area is in, in culture. So here we have a, 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 a couple of groups. One is in a crisis because their uh, founding uh, 
uh, director general has passed away and the, um, the they have a membership hundreds of members and they have a board and the and the board is now desperately looking for somebody to take the reins of their organization the other organization in culture does something very close to what they're doing they were strangely uh, kind of cooperator co competitors um, you know, but offering kind of very similar uh, with a quite a different business model, quite similar support in culture. Uh, the second group was a more like a worker co-op hiding inside of a nonprofit organization. Its main purpose was to serve the community, but it also was to create some employment, a uh, quality employment um, uh, for the founding members. All right. Uh, so, so, well, uh, they found each other and they worked together. It took a year uh, to, to manage the merger. Um, th there was six months of strategic planning tables uh, in the area of finances, the finance of the organization, the sustainability and the politics. Uh, they, they produced a summary document uh, to try and chart a pathway forward. Uh, they really had two totally different organizational cultures. Yes, we have a, they're both nonprofit organizations. They both have a, a, a board of directors, but one had a large membership and those members would come to the annual general meeting and they, they had, uh, you know, with membership comes certain, certain uh, benefits. So it, it, that's a quite a different kind of culture than a small group who are, are, are doing a very focused job. Um, so two, two organizational cultures quite different that need to come together somehow. Um, there were governance and there were administrative issues as well. The most difficult area for this case, for this particular first case was in accounting. Um, all right. Uh, but the, the, the favorable thing was that that board for that organization whose founding member had died, they needed uh, new leadership. And so there was no competition, if you want, between the two key, key stakeholders in a nonprofit organizations that is your direction general, your 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 general manager, your 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 executive director. In a merger situation with two executive directors, that's pretty tricky. I think we can agree on that. All right. They did successfully merge, and they didn't lose any employees. All right. Here's the second case. Uh, four organizations in in, a, in an inner city Montreal scenario, all working in food food security in some way or, or other. Um, that's that's uh, they're getting uh, some funding from the same funders. Uh, other organize other uh, sectors, other parts of Montreal are served with often a single organization or maybe two, but in this neighborhood there were four. That's uh, that's it's very expensive. Uh, there's been pressure from their funders to to find a common pathway so you don't have to pay for uh, executive directors. So there's, there's some, you know, some, some outside pressure, but also just common sense, uh, you know, um, can't we find a way to work together? So this took two years, this, this, this uh, to, of reflection and, and one year of, of seriously hard work. Uh, the one one of their funders uh, paid for some auxiliary support. Uh, so they hired a consultant. Now it was really important that all of the the organizations hired they 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 they, they selected the, the 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 consultant together. So it wasn't one bullying the other two, uh, the other two. In fact, there were three three organizations in the merger. There was a little tiny organization which I'm not going to not important. All right, so. Um, so um, they studied 12 different options. Uh, they did a feasibility study um, and they, 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 they had to proceed really in two steps. The first uh, large step was figuring out from the 12 solutions, what is, what is, what is, our, our, what is, our, what is our strategy forward? And the, the second part was, how do we do that? Like, how do we actually, now we know where we're going, how do we do it? All right. In, the, in that first phase, figuring out from the 12 options, which one uh, we're, going to, uh, we're going to adopt. Um, it was really important, uh, our, our key informant told us, to take the getting to yes approach. That is, uh, we keeping focus on of the conversation on the on the 
on 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 the groups on the on the on the stakeholders on the on the on the community that we're serving what is in their interests not what is in our interests as an organization what is in our community of uh, 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 that we're serving what is in their interest all right <clears throat> Um, the boards, each of the boards were, 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 were very conservative, very cautious. They were very anxious that they had a fiduciary responsibility to their memberships. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe that was, that was an area, uh, uh, which, which was difficult to overcome. You know, boards tend to have kind of ownership over their, their, their mission and over their, their identities, and uh, even if they're serving the same community, even if they're in the same community, even if there's members overlapping membership or or you know rotating um, uh, membership amongst these different boards of directors, um, there's still this 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 uh, um, unusual attachment to to your old your history and your and your identity in, in an organization. I think we'll recognize that, right? All right. Um, but they they managed to overcome that. They found their pathway. They decided to create a new organization. Uh, in in fact, um, and then uh, then the hard then the hard work uh, had to be done. How do you harmonize all of these things? So now we're talking about uh, three different executive directors. Um, each one wants to be the executive director, right, of the new organization. One would think. So th it, it it was very delicate. Uh, you had to harmonize your all the other people. You've got now three accountants. You maybe you only need one. What are we going to do with the other two? So it, it was interesting in that process. Um, the, it was done very, very carefully, very delicately, um, and and and, um, and 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 everybody found a, a place. There were no job cuts in the second in the second case as well. There was a, a jostling, a reorganization. People ch changed hats. Um, some people were ready to uh, move on, uh, you know, and they didn't resist. Uh, so, so, the, but, but it was complex. It was com it was a complex thing. In each of the organizations, also there was slightly different organizational cultures. So, some were more horizontally organized. So, everybody's equal in the staff, and they have staff meetings, and they're democratic. And they, others were, you know, another one was more hierarchical. Uh, so, you know, the DG, you know, sits in their office in a closed door, you know. And, direct staff, you know, and so on. Um, so, so, so that cultural, uh, that cultural diff those cultural differences, even, even in small organizations, with only maybe five, 10, 10 staff are extremely important and you have to be very careful about them. All right. Um, that's the second case. Let me give you the third one here. Um, in this case, uh, um, this is a group I didn't know personally, and so we're here. I, I'm, we were trying to distill from from the founder uh, of one of these organizations uh, who who led the the, the merger, um, kind of a merger. Uh, what the high level lessons are learned. This this gang uh, did it very quickly in six months from idea to completion. Um, they um, hired. Uh, experts to help them in the process uh they they had uh many employees both organizations had very many employees they were very very old um they both had charitable numbers uh but they had a, a very dedicated team that was working on both sides and um with a, quite a common mission um they chose to uh, to unif what's called a unification rather than a fusion, um, but in that process uh, they had to um, they, there was some there was some uh, a very expensive calculations that had to be done. It could only be done by experts uh, outside the organization. So they had to hire people to help them uh, merge uh, and, and and integrate all the different moving parts inside of these two large organizations. Um, um, I could I could go into a bit more detail if a question period if people want to hear um, more about some of those technical challenges. One of the organizations was unionized, the other wasn't. Um, uh, so there was that uh, um, area of complexity and also the geography of the two organizations was quite distinct. Uh, one was serving inner city, one was serving regions. Um, uh, but there was a great deal of trust 
between the two organizations. All right. I think that's enough for the, the three quick stories and let's switch to um, uh, some of the lessons learned. Let me just, I'll just throw this slide in because um, because I love it. <laughs> I think the key stakeholder in a nonprofit organization is your executive director. And the character of that person will, will is super important to understand. Uh, are they, you know, they have, they are, they're managing, they're juggling a bunch of different balls here. I love this slide made by Espas Obenel. So you have, of course, your management here, dark green of the, of the governance structure. Your, your executive director has a, a very important role in, in managing relations with your board and managing stuff in that, in that decision-making part of the organization. Yes, they have a, a role in communication with the outside world. So they're managing their, so, you know, the, the the person who's managing the social networks and so on and so forth. They 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 have uh, they're in the hiring and firing of the people who are going to manage projects. They have to manage the volunteers, or they're responsible responsible ultimately for managing a community of people who are volunteering, including their board, but possibly outside. Uh, you know, getting the funding in, uh, right? The operations, the administration. If they're selling things, uh, it's the financial accounting on that, making sure that the accounting is on that. This is a spectacularly complex role. Um, and it is a role, uh, the power is delegated to this person by the board of by the board of directors. And this person hires then often and, and is responsible for firing all the people under them. They are uh, the lieu nevralgique, I think is a nice word, stolen from French uh, for the organization. So this person's role in the, in a merger is going to be fundamental. All right. Um, but it's, but, and, and, and I think the key word here is diplomacy. Let's switch to the next slide. <clears throat> All right. In a merger situation, when you're trying to scale and you're looking at um, ways to uh, kind of either acquire or merge or uh, in that first in that first column um, that uh, Martin presented, uh, I think that the organizational character and culture cannot be uh, ignored. You really need to understand. You need to do your homework and you need to carefully consider. You're doing a kind of a power analysis, if you want. Of of the uh, of the of the scenarios before you, and don't underestimate the uh, this this piece right here, the membership structure. Um, what is it? Uh, you know, how, how, does it fit? Are they the same? Are they different? Uh, membership both of the organization, membership of the board, uh, your regi and ten, your your constitutions. You need to look at those and think carefully about that. Uh, do you have a, a culture perhaps of having external experts on your board in one organization, but not on the other? Maybe the other one is much more homogenous in its, uh, in its membership on the board. Uh, so who is going to manage this process? Um, is this something that is going to be board driven uh, or is it going to be executive director driven? Uh, there may be a committee of the lead staff who are driving the process. Um, you know, uh, but, 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 uh, in, in a two, in, when there's two organizations, three organizations, it's super important to, to have, um, uh, all three, um, it, it controlling that process, uh, so that you don't have one, um, the, or even the perception of one, uh, seeming to dominate, uh, the process. So be very careful about that. And that leads us to the getting to yes attitude. If you haven't read getting to yes yet, I strongly encourage you to do that. Um, it's a great, it's been in my toolkit and I've taught uh, the, the approach for now maybe 20 or 30 years. It's the Harvard Negotiation Project wrote a lovely book and you can find a lovely short versions of them. Um, uh, there's some YouTube videos uh, out there as well that uh, walk you through the basic principle, but and we, it's almost become a, uh, it's almost become part of our vernacular to talk about having a plan B when you go into a negotiation. Um, uh, they, in this book, use the acronym BATNA, best alternative to a negotiated agreement, but really it's a plan B. 
when you go into a negotiation with this, you, you need to um, not only have your, your um, the community served as, as central to your preoccupation, but also um, you need to think about your plan B and C in, in a negotiation process and be ready to uh, give uh, up to a point and have, have defined you you know just how far you're going to go and if you can't make it then you've got you you've got another scenario that you're willing to um, you know th that's going to make you as happy as negotiating a successful agreement. I think we talked about the devil in the details um, and we can come back to that. But um, be prepared after you finally got an agreement on where you're going, and now you're in the process of going there. Be ready for many, many, many hours of pain. <laughs> many hours of pain. Accountants, lawyers, um, you know, uh, people are going to be, you're going you're gonna to need auxiliary help. And that, and that means you're going to have to divorce some, some financial resources to that. And there are funds available from various government pots or foundations to, to help you in a, in a situation like this. Uh, um, yeah. All right. Human resources. I mean, obviously, the executive director is, is going to be central in, in, in the process, but, but all of the staff are super important. You, you need to be very careful as you're sharing the idea with your staff to do it in a delicate way and in a lovely way and, and, and um, in a way that makes them, uh, you know, um, uh, feel like they're participating in this process. Uh, if you if you um, make a misstep at the beginning, the and I say you, I'm saying the, the group that is going to try and um, engage the stakeholders in a conversation, exploratory conversation about well, what are the strengths and weaknesses of possibly a merger? Um, if you haven't done that very carefully, then uh, uh, then you may find a, 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 um, a reaction will uh, will uh, um, develop among in your staff and if you lose control of the conversation that way then you may find yourself with a great deal of resistance so 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 be very careful um i say power analysis i know I, i've put on my machiavellian hat here um but in a most gentle way you need to be aware it's 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 it, don't be naive about it um there are going to be um the potentially um there might be resistance to to the idea and um, so you need to, uh, you know, uh, um, prudence, dict, comme on dit en français. Uh, think about all the people. I mean, I mean, the most important people are the the staff, right? They're the ones delivering your mission on a day to day basis. Um, where are they at in their lives? Do you have a sense of that? Uh, do you do you feel that um, you know uh, if if there is going to be some um, some loss of employment? Do you know? Uh, think about that and worry about that. Where where is this person going to go if 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 this happens? Like be, try to have a three hundred and sixty on 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 the situation, both in your own organization but also in your sister organization or or, or the other organizations you're working you're working with. Consider the working conditions. Um, I, I'll just just a little. I, I just have to smile here. I remember when we had the um, merger of this at the city of, of the city of Montreal's public service, the the the, the merger, uh, demerger. What was it called? Fiasco, um, fusion, uh, defusion, confusion. Period. Um, the collective agreements had to be negotiated with all the unions across the island of Montreal, and um, and after the dust settled, all of the public employees went to the highest tier of the employment scale. So some of the cities had, had, were paying their unionized workers less than the uh, others. And at the, after the dust settles, they all, all, all the ones who were getting paid less got, got a, a very nice, a very handsome raise. So um, imagine that, uh, you know, that, that, that you're going to be negotiating probably upwards um, in your working conditions. And I think that's a very good thing. All right. Conclusion, of course, is that staff are key. All right, here, I love this slide. This is my last slide, I think. The devil's in the details. Um, but imagine all of this has to be done, right? Uh, charitable numbers. If you have a, 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 one with a charitable number, one without, I mean, how are you going to, you know, how are you going to manage this? You'll have to renegotiate with, with uh, Revenue Quebec, with Revenue Canada. Um, all your information systems, 
uh, complex. I'm, I'm in the middle of changing emails at Payment Memorial. I've lost contact with a lot of people. You know, prepare for turbulence. Um, you know, your your HR uh, policies have to be merged. Um, your balance sheets and accounting. Oh my goodness! Can you imagine the hours of pleasure your accountant is going to go through trying to make all that work? Um, prepare yourself for a very long, you know, for for a, a, a you know a period of transition and uh, patience. Yeah, the key thing. Try and keep the fact that you're a mission driven organization. And so is your sister organization or organizations. Try and keep your eye on the ball that you're here to serve um, a, a, a population, a need, and uh, keep smiling. And you should be you should be fine. Do I have another slide? I think I'm finished. Yes. Thank you, Jason. Uh, that was a very interesting presentation, and I think that. Uh, both yours and and Viviana's presentation really put the the emphasize on the need to 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 plan properly that, that there are different issues that will come up. Uh, we've talked about uh, change management, for instance, issues in terms of governance of uh, uh, access to financial resources and so on. So we really feel that uh, one thing that comes out for me is is the need to have good partners to do that and to find. Uh, go find the right resources to 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 move along uh, with confidence uh, in the process by by going to see Viviana. I've worked in the last years with uh, Jason, Viviana, and uh, Martin from the CDRQ. Fantastic uh, people to have on board with your project to help you think about the blind spots that Viviana <laughs> talked about because there are many, and they can give you also some examples of of. Uh, opportunities or, or organizations that have been going through similar uh, situations and that you can learn from, from those lessons. Um, it was reminding me also, we can open the floor to some questions, but uh, there are a lot of organizations now documenting their own process. I was thinking of Bonne Compagnie, uh, which is a cooperative that, that uh, documented in a blog the merger that they had, one company is the result of a merger between two uh, cooperatives, and they have documented the process in a blog. And we can see that the process, which took about one year, uh, was full of, it was great to have the idea at the beginning. You have two organizations that share similar values that work well already with each other that did not want to compete uh, with each other. So the merger was the proper solution that they had uh, thought about, but then the whole process, it's interesting to read it as an article, uh, what went through and the different blind spots that they met along the way uh, on the road. So if you have any questions, I'll let, uh, you can raise your hand. We're not so many, so I feel that it's not necessarily to, to write them in the chat. Uh, but if you have um, some questions, you can just raise your hand and you can discuss directly with the experts. I have a I have a question. Uh, does any is any group in this room uh, thinking about doing some kind of merger or trying thinking about scaling? Oh, but I see somebody has asked a question. Terry, sorry. It's okay. Um, so I actually do work at PM in Montreal West de Lille, uh, and I'm also on a board of a social economy uh, organization. Uh, my question is. For sure, there's always many factors for success. My question is, when you don't have those factors for success, and I know that governance, and I this is like key to any organization, but let's just say you don't have all the factors and you're not, you know, is there, I, I don't even, but my question is, at what point do you decide to dip your toes into the water or to push back, you know, like there's so much potential. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's the case for a lot of organizations, but you're not going to have every sec, you know, factor. Yeah, there is in the TS guide, there is a, are we ready? Mm. Yeah. It, oh, like um, checkbox, like a, like a, a... literally. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Great. it's a, it's a diagnostic to a self-diagnostic for your organization to sort of think uh, in, a, in a structured way. Uh, through 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 that question, are are we ready? And um, I I don't uh, has that been translated, uh, Martin? Because I know that there were there was a series of about seven or eight books. Have they all been translated? The most recent one are not up online yet, but uh, the the guide and what's in the guide. So I think there was the, the questionnaire has been translated. Yes. 
good, good. Yeah, so so that's an excellent starting place. And it was very well done. And it was you see the beautiful thing about the TS documents is that they're they're not uh, they're 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 co-constructed with real organizations really going through the process. So it's it, they're very, very good. I, I I again I'm just gonna profess love for TS. I just love you guys. <laughs> Thank you. It reminds me, uh, Terry, we had a an organization that we we had a community of practice put in place last year to to walk along if we want to observe the process of scaling uh, for organization that were interested in going through a scaling strategy. And in the end, one of them decided they were not ready to scale. And that was fine because with the proper experts, they were able to identify at the beginning, they were ready to jump in. And we realized along the way, if they had, maybe they would not have survived mm -hmm. today. So the idea was to say there are facility conditions. They were about able to think of, okay, this is going to come up along the way. These are the different blind spots that we had not considered, which means that today we are not ready to scale. But we know what we need to do in order to be ready next year, the next two years. From that moment, they had uh, a plan uh, outlined for the next next year, next two years, and, and they were able to say, okay, once we have all this figured out, we'll be, we'll be able to go. And just to, as a, the, the facilitating conditions are sort of like the ideal type. Uh, of course, they don't usually have all of the box checked, um, but usually we know that they know where to move forward uh, from yeah. that moment. Vivian, well, we're being, we're, being we're, do, we're in the midst of a strategic plan and all that. I just, sometimes it's like, it's good to, you know, the more reassuring, <laughs> not, you know, you can't, you, you can't guarantee anything, but, you know, sometimes it, there, there's that a point where you, where you, it'll, you'll be able to, to make a decision with a very clear conscious that this is direction you should go in. Um, Viviana, were you, is your hand up? I, I would just, I would just want to insert something right here. Obviously, in when you're doing this, it takes, it takes guts and you're taking a risk. When you when you embark on 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 scaling, it, it, you you have to put on your courage hat, <laughs> and sometimes and it, it's gonna be it's gonna be hard. It, it's not gonna be easy. It's gonna be hard, and 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 it's gonna be dangerous. So you know, but you know, but if you have cur if you have courage, strength, and and you've you, you've got the support of the key stakeholders, then you can succeed in in it. Um, but, uh, you know, are we ever really ready? There, I said it. <laughs> Go ahead, Viviana. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, I would like to, to um, it's for the, to answer the uh, Terry's question. It's, it's a great question. And to, um, to support uh, even more what Jason Martin uh, just said, uh, we, when we uh, we have a mandate where we are gonna where we're gonna use the scaling uh, strategy as a tool for for the enterprise uh, to solve the enterprise um, opportunities, um, we are kind of uh, what we provide is kind of a stewardship of the process. So we. Uh, of course, courage and uh, and and uh, bravery is important. Uh, what we bring as value on the table is really, um, you know, to to have a process. Uh, what is first? What is later? And uh, what has to be solved first? And as Jason put it, uh, in terms of governance, it's not always easy. But uh, we, with the tools of the uh, TS, it it is possible to to um, kind of uh, provide this stewardship of the process in order to increase the chances of success. So if you work hard and you you follow, not the rules, but you follow the common sense, uh, I don't see why you wouldn't success, you know, and identifying the opportunity, which, which means identifying the problem at the very first, it's very, very important. If you don't know where you're going, you might not get there. That's a very good point, uh, Viviana. Thank you. Um, does anyone else, maybe we, we can take one last question. Uh, hopefully, so 
you know that our, our panelists are from various organizations. They're available. Uh, we're all available to to answer your questions following our presentation and following the webinar. So if you want to, uh, if you have some questions, didn't have the opportunity to ask them today, please feel free to send us a, a quick email. Um, you have our contact information. So Jason from uh, PMM Montréal Centreville, uh, Hoffman Wolf, who has presented the, the, the organization, so CNET, uh, Viviana from the CDRQ, easily accessible, and uh, from the TS, there are also a lot of resources available. Go visit the website. Uh, and I feel that we don't know so much. Uh, we, we've talked about our project was really focused on social economy, but in the past, we were able to present to social purpose organization. And there is a lot of similarities in the kind of question and it goes behind um, a, a scaling strategy, thinking, planning our, our scaling so that we take care of our human resources. I see that it was the co a comment uh, that was made by Olivia uh, in the chat. The human capital element is definitely fundamental and that uh, we have to plan our strategy so we don't stretch out our resources too much so that we have the team on board. So there's a lot of... Uh, of different elements to keep in mind uh, when planning. So if, if that's something that interests you and you want to pursue the conversation, we're more than uh, available to, to do so. So don't hesitate to contact us. Um, so if there are no other questions, I guess uh, we can uh, end it here. Thank you very much for participating uh, today and feel free to download the guides. They're uh, available for free on the website of the TS. And we'll be happy to uh, yeah to to continue our work with you. So thank you very much uh, for your participation and uh, have a great afternoon. Have a great lunch. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Very much, lunch. everybody. Thank you. Thanks, bye.